And hey, everyone, I have the fantastic pleasure once again of speaking with the notorious EGS, Emin Gunsir, the CEO of Avalabs. How's it going? Very well. Thank you for having me and great to see you again. Well, thank you. Um, I assume very well is excluding the world burning to the ground as we speak. There is that happening on in the markets. There is that happening with the virus. Absolutely terrible time. Yes, but, you know, we're still... We still have a little bit of, um, we're still healthy and happy and, you know, for another week or so until, <laughs> until we join the ragged, ragged clothed people on the streets. Um, <laughs> but we'll all get through it. We'll all get through <laughs> it. It's going to be great afterwards. And uh, we just are trying to protect the uh, the older folks here. So that's really the big issue, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And although it's not quite as currently in the news as when we first, first chatted about it, um, I wanted it to get some of your take on the whole steam at takeover debacle. So since then, it appears like the summary of the situation was um, Justin Sun, the, the Tron guy, bought steam it, and it, with it included a whole bunch of steam tokens that could be used to essentially make governance decisions because it's a delegated proof of stake system. And then what happened was a bunch of the steam, the other Steam community members didn't like the prospect of him being being able to do that, particularly since there was some sort of an agreement or pledge that those would never be used for governance. Mm -hmm. And so they, they decided to better safe than sorry and basically try to lock those tokens, which resulted in a brief takeover of all of Steam by not only those, but also um, colluding exchanges. Just mysteriously, all the exchanges used all the customer funds and just took over the network. And then there's a huge backlash. The, the network, the, the exchanges backed off when they started losing customers. And then now it seems to be sort of at a stalemate or mm -hmm. steam, the original steam people take, took back over. Yeah. They and, went back to normal as it should, I think. Yes. And it seems to be, it's like it system worked as intended. It's great. So it seems, you know, it's in, but I don't see that, oh, the whole network got <laughs> taken over by a hostile party for just a few days, maybe. But I don't see that as something that's like the system working. I don't know. What's your take on that? Yeah, I got a lot of things to say on this front. Um, number one, the system was taken over by one person, Justin, right? That's that's really what happened. He managed to... Um, uh, to uh, uh, convince other people to use the tokens at hand uh, and uh, and and organize, orchestrate a coup essentially. So uh, this shows us that these coins that have one key person behind them are absolutely not centralized. Decentralization is a total thing. There is this thing called the Gini coefficient, and mm -hmm. uh, it, what matters is the bottleneck. It doesn't matter if you have this ginormous flask with a giant base of, let's say, miners. And it uh, doesn't matter if you have this ginormous flask with a giant body of uh, coin, you know, people who are holding coin. They have a wide coin distribution. Those are wonderful things. If you have one guy and you have one code base and you have that one guy in charge of that one coin base and the future of the coin, then essentially everybody else are his, uh, you know, his people, let's just put it that way. There's another word that's on my mind. Yeah. I think people are getting it um, that I don't want to use. So uh, so that's really what happened there. And uh, he easily convinced the exchanges to, to cash in with customer funds. So that's one. I think when, when people are evaluating platforms, they have to look carefully into, you know, who, who, what kind of a thing is behind it? What's the Gini coefficient? Is there only a single client? If so, it's a joke. It's not decentralized. Whoever is in charge of that repo is in charge of the coin. That's one. Two, um, the uh, you know people will try to pitch this as a failure of DPoS of delegated proof of stake. I don't see it as such. Um, I see this as primarily a Steam failure. I see it as primarily a Justin Sun kind of an engineered effort. Um, I also see it as in the long term there was a big successful uh, recovery. So I see it as a positive thing. The right things did happen eventually. Um, but uh, but let's see. There is one in intermediate point I wanted to make, which was uh, the um, on the takeover front. It's not a failure of DPoS, but it is a failure of these systems. Okay, 
why are they, rather, it's not a failure of proof of stake in general, but it's a failure of this model, this approach, the STEAM approach to consensus. Now, what's the STEAM approach to consensus? It's this thing called delegated proof of stake. Why is Justin, and in fact, why is STEAM, rather, uh, doing delegated proof of stake? There's a very simple technical answer for this. It's because the consensus protocol is unable to accommodate more than a handful of participants. They need to winnow down the number of participants, the number of validators, the number of stakers. Every coin in existence today has to do this. Every proof of stake coin has to do this. ETH 2.0, when it comes out, it's going to come out with a design which is essentially identical to EOS. And EOS is essentially identical to Steam that came from the two, the last two came from the same person. Yeah, so, why does this whittling down happen? Why does it yeah. need to happen? Well, it has to happen because when you have proof of stake and you have these participants who want to join the protocol, you want to keep down the number of participants. These protocols all require um, this process called consensus. We have to all agree that uh, you know, Alice gave Bob so many coins and then Bob gave them to Charlie and so on and so forth. Those decisions have to be made uh, in, a, in a synchronous fashion, in a manner where everybody makes the same decision at the same time. So, uh, and the way the protocols work, it's kind of like, uh, like running a parliament, if you will, but without somebody in charge. Everybody has to run their own parliament. Now, what the hell does that mean? That means that you, as a participant in these networks, for yourself, have to validate that a decision took place. And I, as a participant, have to validate that a decision took place. Now, how do we do that? Well, in the parliament, the guy in charge takes a big vote and sees how much of a quorum supports the decision. Right? If a hell of a lot of people say yes, then that thing has been passed. Right? So, um, so that's really generally how it works. They, they, the person taking the poll um, has to ask everybody, and he has to see if there is a super majority. Right? You can't just take... Uh, let's say a 51% majority. Why? Because 50% could be honest, 50 or 14, whatever, 50% could, uh, could be Byzantine, could be messing with you. And that one person, one additional person can, can flip the network, can create a safety violation. Or rather, in fact, it's actually worse. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't say that properly. It could be the case that half the people think Alice gave the money to Bob, half the people think Alice gave the money to Charlie, and then one Byzantine guy could convince one set of people that Bob has the money, another set of people that Charlie has the money. That's a safety violation. Now, suddenly you've got two divergent uh, sets of beliefs that cannot uh, be merged together. There's a big problem. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to have a big quorum. How big a quorum? It turns out that you have to seek 67%. Okay, so I have to do my polling and I have to hear the same answer from 67% of the participants. You have to do the same thing. Every single one of the participants by themselves and independently without relying on anybody else has to do the same polling. So that means that if you have 100 people, you have 100 polls going on, each involving 100 other people, 99 other people. So 100 times 99, you know, do the math, that's about 10,000. That's a hell of a lot of messages going around. So imagine that, you know, and how many people would like to participate in, in the governance, in the management of STEAM? I would say no less than 10,000 people. But you can't accommodate all 10,000 because 10,000 people asking 10,000 other people is 10,000 squared, which I think is 100 million messages. So every decision is going to take approximately, I don't know, a couple of minutes, which is not acceptable for any of these systems. So, um, so that's where the delegates come in place? Yeah, that's where the delegates come in place. Now you need a delegate. You need to winnow it down so that we don't have 10,000 participants. You've got to have a smaller number. How small? About 100 is the practical limit with these protocols that are N squared. So if you look at uh, Facebook's Libra, it's also a protocol in the same family. Uh, Facebook's Libra has it's, it's, its goal is to support up to 100 participants. And its current reality is 28 measly participants. It's Zuckerberg and 27 friends. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with. Uh, all of these proof of stake systems that are currently being deployed are pathetic in their decentralization. 
they cannot scale by design, by, by their very nature. They're not geared uh, to scale up to large numbers of participants. Yeah, so when we, we also have the different angle of it where the entire, the reason why they're Sybil resistant, right, is because all nodes have to, basically you have to prove like you, you got some of that money in yeah. order to, to run this. And the problem is it seems like exchanges have a lot of that money. Yeah. And I was personally surprised at how, um, like I knew, you know, obviously Justin Sun is a person of some kind of wealth and influence. I thought more concrete influence over um, his own network and softer influence over others. But it seems like it acted almost like he ran all the major exchanges, even though I don't think this is the, the case, but it seems like he just, you know, uses phone a friend lifeline and just just says, hey, can you like help me take over the Asher? And like, they didn't even think about it or its repercussions. And just, I believe that's called embezzlement, right? Is appropriation of funds for something that's not in there, that's, that they're not authorized to do. So what I would consider a massive embezzlement of customer funds across many exchanges that then they, they found different creative ways of uh, explaining away whether oh technical difficulties or I don't know it was, but what happened was you know I mean I, I wasn't there I have no proof but what it seems to, to have happened is one guy said hey exchanges just go take these guys you know governance away from them and do you see that as a problem of all stake based systems maybe not a necessarily an insurmountable problem but definitely a serious one where a few large actors that can be easily influenced by say state actors can control like a super majority of the tokens and therefore the entire coin. That's, that is true. Um, existing proof of stake systems do have this problem uh, where exchanges, which end up having a lot of funds end up having a lot of power. And um, there is no way to uh, have the exchanges custody your coins for you um, and hold the value for you while you yourself retain the voting rights. The exchange ends up having everything that, that's possible with the coin and they can misappropriate that power and uh, use it to, as you said, to take over uh, an existing network. So um, uh, that said, you know, I'm, I'm still bullish in the area and I'm still bullish in, in even these first generation coins, these first generation proof of stake coins. You know, this happened once, it's happened in a relatively small uh, system. And um, I don't think people will uh, stand for it again. I don't think that this is going to be an ongoing thing. Like we, we dealt with it once. I think they are, uh, the, the exchanges are going to be very, very loath to take over, um, you know, the, any system and to take over their customers' voting rights away from them. Yeah, that, that still introduces an area where ooh, now they, but we, we know that they can and they can act quickly yeah. and that becomes a little chilling. Now, what doesn't seem to be vulnerable to this exact problem is proof of work systems. Mm -hmm. But it seems like there might be a different vulnerability where, for example, say 75% of Bitcoin's hash rate is in China through a few major mining pools. And I don't, I can't see it as exactly um, that difficult for a state actor, for example, to strong arm them into doing something mm -hmm. and not even like shut them all down, but strong arm them into rejecting certain transactions or doing some other things. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, again, another key figure in this whole thing, uh, CZ of Binance, um, uh, he was uh, central to this whole um, Steam nonsense. But then before when there was that big Binance hack, he casually threw out there about, oh, we have some miners, we can just reverse these transactions. And then later he was just like, <laughs> just kidding, guys. And I kind of didn't take that as a just kidding guys. I took that as like a Freudian slip kind of you thinking out loud about what could actually be done. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think proof of work is any less resistant or any more resistant? How do you think that that figures out? Absolutely not. Proof of work has a lot of things going against it. In fact, many more compared to proof of stake. Proof of stake is strictly more powerful in what it can do compared to proof of work. Uh, a lot of things are externalized in proof of work. They happen behind the scenes. They happen implicitly. And uh, in proof of stake, they are at least within the system. You can see them happening. And if you design your POS system properly, you can avoid some of these scenarios. 
Now, um, if we uh, look at like, let's say the Bitcoin mining sk uh, scene, you know, the Bitcoin community is very upset at Bitmain, but Bitmain is the dominant miner. 95% of the mining rigs out there come from Bitmain. They determine who becomes a miner and who doesn't. You gotta be in, in you know, you gotta have a great relationship with Jihan and, uh, and his company if you want to remain in that business for long. Um, and uh, let's see, at the, at the end of the day, uh, if I look at, you know, last time I looked at Bitcoin, I don't know what it is now, but last time I looked at, um, there were only 19 mining pools. So all that decentralization comes down to 19 um, positions of power. Now, people who are Bitcoin maxis are going to go up in arms and say, well, how can you say that there are so many more miners, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there are so many more miners, but they're getting their command control. They've deferred their command and control to the mining pools, just like the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the coin holders had deferred their command and control to exchanges. So it's the same analogous problem. There are only 19 uh, controllers, if you will, uh, of what goes on the blockchain in Bitcoin. It's a tiny number. It's worse than it's worse than EOS. Everybody makes fun of EOS for not being centralized enough. Uh, we talked about their problems a second ago. And, uh, and then now what? So Bitcoin isn't that much better. And in fact, it's strictly worse. Um, I haven't checked recently, but I think it's, it's still in the two dozen uh, range or so. And certainly three or four of these are... Uh, are over the, you know, they make up more than 51% of the hash power. So if they decide to keep a certain transaction out, they can orphan blocks all day long and uh, keep those transactions out. So uh, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in a very, very funny spot, right? Um, you've got these, uh, these proof of work systems. And, um, uh, you know, I think uh, an analogy that you have used before is a penny farthing bicycle, right? They're mm -hmm. like uh, the ancient systems of old. And we all love them, right? I love Bitcoin. It's like it's like your first kiss. You can never forget that moment. It's a special moment. Um, but uh, but it is a moment long, long past in history. We've gone beyond it, and uh, we're looking for more meaningful relationships. <laughs> we're looking for, if you will, uh, better systems that don't suffer from the problems of, of these first-generation proof-of-work systems. And then you've got the first-generation proof-of-stake systems, which have their own problems. So the area is constantly evolving. We're moving towards better and better protocols. Yeah, so that kind of brings us around to Ava Labs. And I remember, I, I think it's something that flies under the radar for a lot of people, uh, certainly for me, which is, you know, even though, which is surprising, even though I know you, but I heard, first off, I heard the term avalanche first discussed in context of making Bitcoin Cash specifically more uh, resistant to to attacks more so you could cr create like a zero confirmation type of a, a, a security much more easily much more quickly so you could trust us a within five seconds about mm -hmm. trust as something as secure so first off is there a relation between the two the two avalanches is like because most people think of that as that and then they're like well what's this avalabs thing Oh, okay, okay. So let me uh, let me sort of give everybody the history then. So um, Avalanche Protocol is an independent thing, and it is the biggest thing in distributed systems to happen since the Bitcoin white paper. I don't see this, say this lightly. Um, let me give everybody sort of a very brief history of my area. This is the area that I've worked in. It's a young area. I, it's only been around for 45 years. And about 45 years ago, people started realizing, hey, if you have a distributed system and it has to take coordinated action, it's pretty crucial for all the nodes to agree on what happened. We have to have a, a log, if you will, uh, of what happened. So um, uh, that begat the entire consensus problem. Um, many, 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 many protocols were developed, but all within the same context, all within the same framework. That framework is this framework of nodes that ask every other node, this parliament mechanism that I talked about. And the, uh, the, the, the people I love uh, very dearly, two, two people, Leslie Lamport and Barbara Lisko, um, got Turing Awards for the work that they did and contributions that they did to computer science in hashing out that entire framework, in establishing it, and in giving rise to hundreds of protocols. 
Now, those protocols were in existence. They were very well known. And in fact, there were so many of them. And it had become, like as an academic, I can say this, it had become a cottage industry, right? You take one of these protocols, you uh, make one of them slightly more efficient, and then you get a paper out. A lot of my colleagues were in this business of writing these in incredibly incremental papers, uh, you know, with, with tiny little improvements on the basic design of, I ask everybody, they all tell me, and then everybody else asks everybody else, and they all tell them kind of a protocol. And um, Satoshi knew about this. He's no dummy. His, his emails do, you know, display what, exactly what he knew. And he makes it very clear. It, those protocols are not suitable for an open permissionless network. They are fragile. Now, if you don't believe me and you don't believe Satoshi, just go look at EOS. It had a hiccup just maybe two weeks ago. Right? These things happen. Look at uh, Stellar. Stellar was stopped. It was down for like most of a day uh, two, two and a half years ago, I think two years ago or so. So there have been yeah, a that. bunch of these networks that just essentially went down. So then Satoshi comes in and says, look, you academics, you've been working on this crap for a while. It's all fine and good, but it's not suitable for what I want to do. And uh, I mean, it is suitable for you know, a bunch of things, but, but not this, not cryptocurrencies. So he comes up with this proof of work scheme, which is brilliant. And, uh, and then it gave us the revolution that, we, that got us all super excited. And then the latest thing was in 2018, a team that calls itself Team Rocket came up with an anonymous paper. And that paper describes an entirely new approach to consensus. It says, look, don't be doing this fragile old thing. And don't be doing this mining thing. The mining thing is slow. The latencies are enormously long. Bitcoin's latency is one hour. So, um, uh, and it, it's not inclusive. Mining has become a professional task, right? You and I can't meaningfully participate. It's just, you gotta have a data center. You gotta have a cable this thick going to the nearest power station or else you're not in that game. So, um, uh, so it's a pro pro pros game. And worst of all, it's constantly leaking uh, money value to these miners. It's constantly leaking money from the miners to the power company. So you're trying to build a store of value, and then suddenly the value is constantly going to these other people. So the Team Rocket guys say, look, don't be doing that either. That's not good. And then this old scheme of like classical protocols, uh, they don't work because there's a lot of people who have to ask a lot of other people. And, you know, you get M squared, and that's not good. So um, what does, uh, uh, what does uh, team, team Rocket say? Well, let's do uh, repeated subsampled voting. So essentially, you ask just a few other people in multiple rounds. I can describe exactly how this works in more detail if you like. But mm -hmm. uh, it's a much more efficient process. So instead of everybody asking everybody, um, what you do is uh, you're, you're trying to take a decision. And you're going to try to take a decision in something as big as a stadium, right? Tens of thousands of participants. That's what we want to do in Alva, at Alva Labs. Build a system where anybody can participate from their phones if they so choose. So you can't run any of these protocols. You can't mine on a phone, and you certainly can't meaningfully participate in proof of stake from a phone because you know there are only about a hundred people who can participate. You have to you know it down as we discussed. So okay, so how do you do it in Avalanche? Imagine you have a giant stadium, very big one, giant stadium right here in New York City. And I don't know everybody in it, and but I know some people, and you don't know everybody in it, but you know some people. So what I have to, what we all do is, is this. It's very dumb and very simple. You pick a small number of people, let's say five people, and you say, hey, guys, I'm trying to decide. Did Alice pay Bob or did Alice pay Charlie? What do you currently think? And then the responses come in as people say, Bob, Bob, Charlie, Bob, Charlie. And, now, and then I go, well, based on my sampling, it looks like my cohort at the moment uh, uh, seems to think Bob got paid. So I'm going to change what I think towards Bob. Now, if you do the same thing at the same time as me, and we repeat this dumb process, then the math shows, and this is the magic of that Team Rocket paper, the math shows that in a very modest number of rounds, we achieve consensus. Everybody comes to believe that Bob has the money or Charlie has the money. It doesn't matter which one, but they take the same decision. So it's an amazingly efficient protocol. And a few dozen rounds is something that takes about a second on the internet. It's no time at all. 
So in a second, you take a decision that is immutable and final. It's as final as an hour has passed on Bitcoin. It's as final as 45 minutes on Ethereum. So it's very, very, very uh, much uh, the same kind of property as, uh, uh, as what you're used to with, with a very deep, long blockchain. It's immutable. It cannot be reverted. So Yeah, uh, so let, let's go a little, maybe not too much more tactical, but just slightly more in the details. So say you have a, a group of like five participants. Three, three agree for one, two agree for the other. So the consensus of that group is for the majority, correct? Uh, no, it actually it's probabilistic. So mm -hmm. what's going to happen is so five is a very small number. Uh, we can do it, you know, I can do it on my hands. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this fellow, no, person number one, is going to sample some other some other people. And mm -hmm. let's let's say because it's a small group, he's going to sample three people. And he samples, samples some of them. And this guy is going to sample three other people. That guy is going to sample three other people and on and on. Okay, so they'll all sample. And they'll repeat this process for, I think for these numbers, they probably need to repeat it about five or six or seven times or so. Okay, and depending on how they sample, they will flip one way or the other. They're essentially, what's going on is it's a dynamic system that isn't stable until everybody has picked the same, uh, same choice. So imagine, imagine don't, don't take your borderline case. Imagine a group mm -hmm. of five where four of them have decided that Alice has the money. And sorry, Bob has the money. And then this last one thinks that Charlie has the money. Okay, now let's see what would happen uh, after one round. So if this is the case, if we got to this point, then this guy will sample, he's gonna sample three people and no matter which three he chooses, he is going to decide that Bob got the money. Same for this, same for this, same for this. And this guy who currently thinks Charlie got the money, he is gonna sample and no matter what he does, he's gonna flip as well. And he's going to, and the network is going to go into a unanimous decision. You can work backwards from there and uh, you can see that there is a, a bell-shaped curve. Like if you look at the energy of the system, if it's a 50-50 split, then it can go either way. But the more of one, one side you have, the more of one color you have or the one choice you have, the harder it is to go back up the hill and down into the other decision. And when everybody has made the same decision, then the network is at a, what we call a low energy state. It has decided it's going to take enormous amounts of energy. To, in fact, it's going to be impossible to take it back out and onto the other side. Hmm, interesting. So, how many? So, if there's like, let's say, ten thousand total participants, right? Um, and so there would be a group of say, how many that that gets pulled each time that does the sampling? Five to ten. It doesn't matter um, how many. So the many of the parameters in the system. Uh, are independent of the network size. That's one of the beauty, beautiful things about it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you can have a huge network. You can have a network of, uh, of a million nodes and you would still sample five to 10 people. So in a network of 10,000, I'd sample 10 uh, just to keep the number of rounds slightly lower than they would otherwise be. But you could sample five and that would work as well. Yeah, so the sample five, they all sample each other. Yeah. They come to conclusion, and then there's another five that does their own group, et cetera, et cetera. And then those final groups start sampling each other again. They go through another round now that they've already decided, and then it just kind of kind of compounds like that. Um, yeah, but it's not groups. So mm -hmm. here's how it works. Imagine you have 10,000 people, and mm -hmm. imagine you're starting from the worst case scenario. Half the people have heard of... Alice pays Bob, half the people have heard of Alice pays Charlie. So we're at the 50-50 split, worst possible scenario. Everybody samples, let's say five people and says, yo, you know, what do you think? Okay. And you can see that depending on how the randomness plays out, I'm going to ask some people and I might, my, I might ask people who are majority Bob favoring and majority, you might ask people who are majority Charlie favoring and so forth. The chances are incredibly low that at the end of the first round of sampling, that we will still be at a 50-50 split. Some people will ask, you know, like there will be some people, there will be slightly more people who favor Bob or Charlie. So the network will have one of those two decisions uh, a slightly increase in representation. If we start out at 50-50, after one round, 
there will be about, let's say, 51% more people favoring the Bob outcome and 49% Charlie outcome. Uh, it could stay at 50-50, but the chances are very, very small. And uh, if it stays there, then the next round will take care of it. So at each round, it's less likely that you'll stay at this perfect balance point. If you do have a slight majority of one side, so suppose we have 51% favoring Bob, then the network in the next round is more likely to go towards Bob. How much more likely? 51% more likely by statistics. Right? It's pretty mm -hmm. simple at that level. And, um, and so what's going to happen then? Well, they're going to convert more people. So that 51% is going to grow to 53. You do it for another round, it's going to go to 55. Do it for another, 59. And then suddenly it's like going down a hill. It picks up momentum. If you've got 60%, next round is going to be like 68% or, or so. And then suddenly you find yourself falling over this cliff into a full decision. That is the beauty of that math. Yeah, it seems like it seems to be a, a relatively organic way of doing things. Because when I'm, I start to, anytime I try to explain these kinds of things, and I've written articles in the past trying to explain how. Uh, distributed ledger works mm -hmm. to p people who have no technical expertise by using like paper and quill and, and kind of like that kind of um, that kind of terminology. And that does seem to be how an idea tends to spread. Is you have a bunch, you talk to a bunch of people, you talk to your close group of friends because you don't poll the whole world. Hey, what do you think? I heard about this. This is a good idea. This is a bad mm -hmm. idea. And then even if there's dissent, like it tends to kind of coalesce around the one and then over time let's just say days past is like different rounds where people start talking to each other mm -hmm. and then more people are yeah i used to think this but then all my buddies that and then it just it kind of shakes out into consensus although there is no absolute consensus of opinion in the world but i mean for all practical purposes it seems the same now the hitch of course is in proof of work the way you get to participate is by exerting a lot of energy, right? By doing a lot of hash rate that, that gets you a seat at the table and proof of stake, whether delegated or otherwise you own tokens. That's mm -hmm. what makes it, you know, Sybil resistant because otherwise, you know, if I want to do attack an avalanche network, I could, you know, create a whole bunch of dummy accounts. And just so I had, you know, say two thirds, three quarters, and then the odds of the avalanche going not in my favor are very low. Mm -hmm. So what's the anti sybil mechanism for this? What, what, what's the barrier to entry or, or is this just a, a more broad based protocol and each project designed around the avalanche has their different, could have their different way of doing that. Uh, what's a lovely question. Absolutely. This is a bare bones protocol. It is agnostic. You could go and use any Sybil control mechanism with it. In fact, there was a lot of confusion about two years ago or so about consensus protocols. People thought proof of work was a consensus protocol and proof of stake was another consensus protocol. These are Sybil control mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. They keep people out. Uh, they keep people from pretending to be more than themselves, right? That's what they mm -hmm. do. So, um, okay, so what's the uh, Sybil control mechanism one could use with Avalanche? That depends on you. You could couple it with proof of work if you so chose, or you could couple it with proof of stake. In fact, um, BCH, Bitcoin Cash, was uh, using uh, Avalanche uh, to, uh, or what was considering using it. They did a lot of development uh, on this front, by the way. Uh, they wrote a lot of code to, um, uh, to, to uh, use Avalanche for taking quick decisions on zero conf transactions. So by zero, miners though, right? Pre-miners. So the mining is um, uh, the mining is happening uh, by by regular miners. Minting is happening by regular miners, but zero conf transactions are being decided upon by um, uh, by uh, by the miners themselves using the avalanche protocol. So you could use proof of work as a barrier to entry for avalanche, or you could use proof of stake uh, with avalanche. That's completely up to you guys, up to up to whoever is deploying it. Now at Ava Labs, we're building a platform called Ava. And one of the interesting features, one of the many interesting features is of course it's using Avalanche the protocol, but it also is not using a single virtual machine. 
It is mm. not. So you know how Bitcoin has its own virtual machine uh, that is not Turing complete. And you know how Ethereum has its own virtual machine, the EVM, which is Turing complete. And there are many other virtual machines out there. Libra has Move. Uh, you know, there are a bunch of others that have their own uh, virtual machines. Well, um, Avalanche is agnostic and Ava supports any number of virtual machines. So one of the virtual machines we have is proof of stake based. And another one that we have is actually doing exactly what Bitcoin Cash wanted to do, which is mint coins with proof of work. So we're agnostic. We can do either or both. Yeah, that's um, that's very interesting. And I find that this this tends to be a thing that um, sort of plagues the space a little bit is one thing the, the best part about the space is that everyone is trying everything. Everyone's trying all kinds of things. Anyone can start a project from nothing and they do. And so many of them fail. And that's fantastic because we find out what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And of course, the problem then is now you have a million tokens floating around and there's some good ideas. And it's funny because I've been using a whole lot of um, sort of self-publishing platforms for you know videos, for articles, for all kinds of things. And they're always funny because they all come up with their own little token. And so, for example, I've been using read.cash and that's pretty good, but it's like only Bitcoin Cash. And if you don't talk about Bitcoin Cash, you tend to not get as much traction. Mm -hmm. And then Publish Zero X throws like has for some reason has like bat and then hydro and some other things there's some basic attention token using platforms there's all kinds of things mm -hmm. and it seems like usually when someone says oh i've come up with this great new technology for crypto i'm always just like here comes a token sale here comes a token sale like it's just it's going to have another crappy token associated with it mm -hmm. and it's whether it's a fantastic idea or not it's just gonna like why do we have to start from zero with another thing so it does make it does kind of warm the heart that it's not like it seems like something that's applicable to other things. Now, I my general you know the gut the gut reaction my very non scientific um, way of sort of deciding if things are good ideas or not. Um, if something is radically different from something that's good, generally speaking, I, I have I have a I hold it in a little bit of suspicion until I investigate further. Mm -hmm. If something is too much of a copy, same deal. Mm -hmm. It just if something seems to evolve to reach the same general idea, but have a a unique way of coming about it to to suggest that you know it's actually organically been arrived upon. I kind of find that interesting. So I've been you know paying attention to Dash for a very long time, and the. Um, quorum technology for Mastro seems to have a lot in common with this sort of thing, although you know it's clearly a different system. So, for example, um, with instant send transactions, which are just locked in right away, there's a you know random quorum of Mastro's. Again, you have the subset of let's say five thousand participants, and a group of them is chosen to agree on a transaction, and then another group gets chosen to agree on another transaction, et cetera, et cetera and to lock down to secure the protocol based on the first scene block using chain locks, it's a larger, let's say a few like 400 or 500 masters that forms a long living quorum and for a certain amount of time kind of mm -hmm. does the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's clearly not avalanche, but it's, there's enough similarities that I can see that it's, it's, it's along a similar line of thinking. Dash is an interesting system, and um, I've, I've looked at the code, and I've, I've thought a little bit about it. Um, it doesn't get as much as much uh, publicity as it should. It was there very early. It's one of the earlier ones as well. Um, but Dash's mode of operation is uh, essentially signature accrual, what we call, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got some number of participants, who people who want to participate, who are capable of participating. And But you can't accommodate all of them because you're going to build these signature lists that are very long. So what you do is you pick a subgroup, you call them master nodes, and then mm -hmm. they, they vet each other's blocks. And um, so I haven't looked at the numbers for Dash, um, but I've, I've looked at the values for a project. I've, essentially what I've looked at and I like um, mm -hmm. about Dash is, you know, who are the people behind it? What kinds of goals, technical and social, do they have? And that's very important to me. Um, but uh, 
putting that aside, if I look solely at what's happening, which is mm -hmm. blocks being voted upon by a, a small group, then it is closest in spirit to ETH2O and EOS. And Tezos actually uses a baking scheme that's also very similar. So these are all signature accrual. These are synchronous um, protocols. There is a time bound, right? So there, here is a block that I proposed. And there's only so much time to collect all these signatures. And if I'm not getting those signatures in time, then bad things can happen inside the network. And um, uh, there are some corner cases uh, when the network is really slow that you might perceive my block was not ready in time. Somebody else might perceive that it was, and you start getting into dicey territory. So um, these protocols, um, we haven't had a big, big failure yet because of these issues, but they're fragile because of those issues. So um, Avalanche is not like this. So it's one of the differences from that. Mm -hmm. And um, so as you say, it's, it's, uh, its mode of operation to a techie is radically different. The master nodes, etc. cetera, um, those ideas, signature accrual consensus protocols, they try to give you a final guarantee. They give you, uh, a, you know, they, they try to get enough of a quorum of master nodes to agree. Um, and uh, whereas Avalanche is different, it gives you a probabilistic guarantee, kind of like Bitcoin, except the probabilities uh, of a problem occurring are tiny. Like they're less than the probability of, you know, there is a probability that all the oxygen in this room could go to that side, that side, and all the nitrogen could stay on my side, and then I could just suffocate right in front of your eyes. This is technically possible, but it doesn't happen because it's a tiny probability. We don't worry about this stuff. So in a similar fashion, uh, Avalanche makes sure that, um, uh, that the probability of, uh, of a consensus failure is far, far, far less than, uh, say, the, the probability of your, say, your computer misbehaving because of a hardware fault. So, um, so there are many differences like this. Uh, deep down, are they radically different? Yeah, to a techie they are. Uh, from a non-technical angle, the consensus protocol is, um, is essentially just a faster engine. So if you're just using the system, you're like, whoa, that was fast, is all you see. You don't have to worry about what's on Fast and it doesn't break. And it doesn't break, exactly. Which is hard, it's harder to see than is it fast. If fast, you can see it right away. Right. If it doesn't break, you have to wait until it breaks. Right. That takes years in some cases, actually. Right. It took a while for us to see the stellar failure, for example. And everybody knew that was coming. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's an interesting point you touched on about like values and direction. And that's one thing that I find a lot of people in the space like to disregard because it's the technology is God. And if the technology is sound, Nothing else matters, mm -hmm. and yet it's a it's a system that's highly usage dependent, and because anyone can participate, whoever participates has something to do with the way it shakes out. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I back of course in the toxic maximalism days, which you know they're still around a little bit. They're, they're still around, but they got their feathers trimmed. They got their wings clipped uh, yesterday. The, the store of value narrative is out the door uncorrelated store of value gone no one no one can say that with a straight face anymore they'll just get laughed at yeah and it's funny it, it's funny how you know again draw possibly drawn way on conversations of ours years prior um i do get the less feeling of like an agenda driven social attack going on it's kind of more it's settled it's over there's less mm. of that going on but when I do look at, at projects for a while, so I have a, a, a amount of friends who are participating in the Bitcoin as VS ecosystem. And there's some interesting projects that have been developed on that chain. And at the same time, I can't get myself to get excited about the project. I mean, for one thing, of course, all the technical issues of just, this seems just like Bitcoin bigger blocks and that's it. And there could that could that needs to evolve eventually after mm -hmm. you know a couple decades maybe um but also just the the culture the attitude mm -hmm. which is something that you know doesn't actually affect the technology yet it does yeah it does and really. so if you if you're driving towards a goal um was it as the great yogi bear once said um be careful where you're going because if you don't know you might not get there mm -hmm. so or so that's kind of where um, 
that's kind of one reason why I'm you know paying attention to things that, for example, like what the work Avalab's doing because I think it's um it seems to be a right headed approach to evolving the system without just saying what new thing can I come up with, what new tangle of a technology can iota zing in there can i come up with that's just going to break but who cares because i've already printed millions of tokens yeah. and i've made money off of them right so let me tell you a little bit about our vision going forward i think you probably have a good grasp of it but the listeners might not so our goal at ava labs with with the ava system is uh not to be a competitor competitor to bitcoin okay so bitcoin is trying to compete with the us dollar that's a very mm. very tall order and uh, they had been using the store of value narrative for doing so. They had been going around telling a whole bunch of fund managers that this is an uncorrelated asset and this and that. And, uh, you know, good power to them. I actually wish them the best. So that's a very hard fight to fight. And that whole payment uh, space is a very hard space to be in, in my opinion. Now, Bitcoin Cash is working really, really hard to get mass adoption. Uh, far more than the Bitcoin folks, right? They're doing a whole lot of experiments. There's a town in Australia that is incentivizing Bitcoin cash use and so forth. That's also wonderful. And um, I do believe that AVA gives you the, the raw tools to build a payment system that's far better than anything we have. Um, but we're not pushing it for payments, okay? So I think that people will always want their payments to be denominated in where they make their money. If I'm getting paid in dollars, I want to know how much I'm paying in dollars. So I think at the end of the day, it's going to be stable coins that are going to be used for payments. So, um, but you know, that's just my own, uh, own opinion. What we're trying to do with Ava is build an asset issuance platform. Digital assets are where it's at. So mm -hmm. I want every single stock certificate to be on Ava as an Ava native token. I want every single bond, every single corporate debt instrument. I want every single piece of gold and I want every single precious stone, not to mention every single commodity that's already traded, as well as every other commodity that is currently not traded to be a token. That's where the value is. There is a call for it. How do we know there's a call for it? Because we already saw that uh, there was an immense, immense hunger for these things during the ICO bubble. People were coming up with terrible, terrible schemes. They were mostly bilking uh, the investors. I agree with that. Most of them were crap, Not the, probably 99.9% were crap. But there is a way to do this in a way that doesn't violate securities laws. And there's a way to do it that doesn't uh, run counter to our laws and regulations and so forth. So here's another thing that happens. If you go down this, this path of, okay, I'm gonna build my own payment system. And all right, it's going to be decentralized. Okay, so that's fine. Um, then where do you where do you, where do you find yourself? Um, the next decision that most techies have to make, and they don't make this explicitly, it just happens for them. They say, well, okay, here's my virtual machine. What's your virtual machine? Well, it's the Bitcoin virtual machine. The only set of rules you can enforce is what is capable of being enforced through the Bitcoin script mechanism. What set of rules is that? It's a bunch of transfers. It knows no law. It obeys no restriction. So this is both a plus for people who are libertarian minded, but also it means that this is something that does not exist within our legal framework. What is the law that Bitcoin abides by? It's nothing. So if you want to be a true Bitcoin maximalist, then you have to eat meat. You have to hang out with people who's, you know, who are like Seyfit Dina Moose or whatever, people who are somewhat not all that bright seeming, I would say. And, uh, <laughs> You know, people who are like you know, just essentially very aggressive and, and, mm -hmm. and just repeat talking points. I don't necessarily want, you know I, you know, I don't want to talk about my family, but, you know, if I had a kid, I wouldn't want my kid act, you know, hanging out with people like that. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. toxic. It's just negative. And what do they have to offer the world? Right? But most of all, what they have to say is screw the laws, screw the state, screw everything. We're going to come up with our own laws. And somehow, of course, those laws first and foremost enrich them. That's really the Bitcoin value system, and it's something that I don't, I don't. It doesn't. Yeah, the current, the current Bitcoin value system. I would argue it's kind of morphed over time. 
it's morphed over time. It wasn't like this when I got in. It was not at all like this. It was very, very different. I think there was a takeover uh, by what I would call riffraff of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And sadly, the core, the core folks, the, the smarter folks in that ecosystem did not rein in the extreme elements. So now we have this terrible, I mean, you know, I, I face a lot of students, right, at, at Cornell as a professor. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I used to give them, uh, I would give them uh, projects involving Bitcoin. They would work on it for a while, like a day or two. And then they'd come back and say, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to be working on this stuff. It's just off-putting to normal people. So um, flipping, flipping this, um, the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the thing that I want to focus on is this inherent drive for people to have to reject the law. You find yourself having to say, oh, I'm a cypherpunk, you know, down with the state. And the person who's saying this, trying to say this most loudly, is a tool um, who comes out of uh, board meetings, um, you know, has, has raised a lot of venture capital, right? So you know who I have in mind. And uh, this is like, it's going to board meetings on the one hand, and, uh, you know, trying to sign agreements and NDAs and various different, you know, God knows how many contracts. And then he steps out and says, I'm a cypherpunk. No, no, you're not a cypherpunk, Adam Beck. You're, you're nothing but, right? He's far from it. So um, Yeah, it's a fantastic uh, cultural sort of movement to observe because yeah. uh, just I, I think there's a, there's a certain fashionability to being something like that. And it's, it's cool. And that's one thing that I believe that the the crypto space kind of leaned into is in absence of actual delivery of things that are useful for the world, yeah. you deliver something that's very culturally significant and people yeah. want to buy into. And that's one thing I've noticed about that seems to have transmitted off into the SV community is there's a high degree of a high social degree of that. Yeah. And so, for example, um, I use Twitch, the BSV run Twitter thingy, and I just poke around in there and see what's that. And the obviously the economics of the system are a completely different discussion, but I do notice that there's a lot of self-congratulatory memes and there's a lot of not logical arguments of use this, your data is secure, you, you know, whatever, again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, use this it's it's going to be more efficient it's like not a lot of that just that join us you'll join us one day anyway this is where all the cool kids are if you don't want to join who cares we don't like you anyway kind of a very social a social construct and right. so it's been interesting to see how the store of value thing has been like a store of, of belief of faith yeah. and it's been yeah. like it's if you value that stuff you're buying in and if you buy in it's if you buy into the mentality you buy in with your with your fiat yeah you buy in with your fiat you buy into a system that's 11 years old um some people have already cornered the market in coins they can manipulate it at will and the chances that you're going to stack sats stack satoshis and get rich through your satoshis uh, is pretty small there are so many people ahead of you that that's just not a winning proposition and, uh, and, and we saw this in the markets. These people have been told to buy the dips, every dip since 16.5 thousand. You know, Adam Back has said buy the dip you know, for a long time on that decline. So there are a lot of people out there who came to crypto, who bought into BTC, who stacked Satoshis, who lost a hell of a lot of money and then left the system. Those people are not going to come back. They were the early adopters. and We turned them off. And if you think about the price of a coin that is leaking five billion per year to power companies, well, where is that price going to go? It can only go down. So the natural tendency for that price is a downward slope, unless there is more money coming in. Well, there is more money coming into Bitcoin. Why? Because we all worked really hard to wave the Bitcoin flag. I was there in the early days. I've briefed more politicos than most other people, except maybe the nice folks at Coin Center down in D.C., so, um, uh, you know, I talked to a whole lot of people. I went to the National Academy of Science, tried to make crypto and Bitcoin a legitimate uh, research topic. So we did all this. And uh, the, the people who came in late, the sacred being the mooses of the world, the, the Bitcoin maxis of the world, um, they, they are the ones who are essentially trying to profit off of that goodwill that we all built while producing nothing of value. Well, let me take the, the conversation to in a positive direction. 
let me tell the viewers about one thing that we're doing, uh, a second thing that we're doing, uh, in um, well, maybe a third thing that we're doing in Ava, uh, because I mentioned two already. I mentioned the consensus protocol, it's super fast. And I mentioned the fact that we can run virtual machines. Anybody can run a separate virtual machine. But there's an additional thing we can do in Avalanche uh, on, on Ava that, uh, that other coins have not, have not been able to do. And it's this thing that we call subnetworks. So what you can do in Ava, because it's an asset issuance platform, is you can create, anybody can create an asset. And in creating an asset, you can define exactly how that asset moves and behaves by defining your own virtual machine. So that I already mentioned. And um, so that's a good thing to be able to do, to have, accommodate multiple different virtual machines. We accommodate the entirety of the EVM within Ava. So all of Ethereum is essentially a subset of Ava for us. But mm -hmm. there's one additional thing you can do. You can say, look, I'd like to launch my own token with my own VM. In fact, I'm going to reuse the EVM. I'm going to have my own version of variant of EVM. Or I'm going to use uh, this other, uh, uh, this other v VM that knows how to treat real estate. You know, if two coins are adjacent, two parcels are adjacent, you can merge them. If, if you like, you can divide them, da, da, da. da. So, um, so you can do that. But in addition, you get to say this. You get to say, I would like my nodes. I don't want everybody on Earth to be participating in this. I want my special nodes to be in this network. Now, in fact, I want only purple colored nodes. Now, what's a purple colored node? Well, as the asset creator, you get to define who's purple. And in selecting your validators, you can then express the unexpressible things that you could not encode into the code. What can you not encode into the code? Well, there are a bunch of things that we don't know how to express in code easily. For example, resource requirements. To participate in my network, you know, I don't want Raspberry Pis, I want nodes with a lot of RAM. You can say this and do this in our world. Or you can say, to participate in my network, you need to, uh, you need to be located in the US. You have to be under US jurisdiction. You have to respect the GDPR for the, for the EU. You have to uh, obey a blacklist. You have to enforce a whitelist. Or you have to have signed a special you know, one to one contract with me to be my validator. In the real estate example, I would like the validators to commit to uh, keeping the records for, let's say, 20 years or so, maybe 50 years. Now, that's expensive. Not everybody should be validating that. And, and, and joining the system should be something that, that takes effort and time and, and, and money and the commitment. But that's, that's the commitment that's necessary. And in return, something funny happens when, when coins, when assets are a uh, first class entity in your system like they are on Ava. Those validators that are buying in, they know what they're doing. They know they're validating my real estate coin. Okay, they're, They should be in the US jurisdiction and they should, should do archival for me. So, they can say, okay, I'll do this, but in return, I want, and I know what I'm doing, I'm buying into your purple coin, and in return, I want uh, transaction fees commensurate with the service I provide. This archival is not cheap. It's going to cost maybe hundreds of, not hundreds, it's going to cost tens of, tens of dollars, and maybe the transaction fees ought to be in the hundreds to thousands. It's a real estate transaction. You can't just build that on any other coin, but you can on Ava. You can express both the in-network rules through these virtual machines and the externalities by controlling the validator sets. So when I talk to these companies that are all doing permission networks, the one crucial thing they want is the ability to control the network. And that's exactly what Ava gives them. So if you want to issue uh, your own tokens, if a company wants to issue their own tokens, and yet they want to talk to the world at large, to other people, to exchanges that take Ava, exchanges built on Ava, then, uh, then the right protocol to use is the Avalanche protocol because these sub-networks of special, specialized validators are bridged together using the Avalanche protocol. So that puts us in a unique position because we give everybody control over their coins, their tokens, their assets with our faster engine, with our... Uh, our ability to accommodate virtual machines and our ability to, to control their subnetworks. Well, fantastic. That seems like a great place to wrap the whole thing up.
Uh, where could people find more about Avalabs? Avalabs.org. Come to our website. We have a Discord channel. We have a Reddit. We have uh, you know everything there is to have. There's a tell. There are many Telegram groups in multiple languages. Come join. It's a very small project. Um, we took only one round of funding so far, uh, so we're very early on. And uh, come be part of the fun. Uh, we're still coming up with use cases, and we just recently opened up our code base yesterday. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, if you have any input on any front, I'd love to hear it. We're running a bug bounty uh, for uh, with up to fifty thousand dollars per bug, and the bug bounty is in a funny is being run in a funny way. Um, we embedded four known bugs, so we know that there are four great you know bugs to find in there, and maybe more. Uh, so come join the fun. It's a great positive group. Um, we've been informed by all of the things that we saw in first generation coins. And uh, we're sitting on top of an enormous technological breakthrough, the Avalanche Protocol. And uh, yeah, just come by. We're nice people. We're trying to change the world. And um, uh, we want to rewrite all the way everything is done. I'm looking at, at uh, FIDI, the financial district of Manhattan, out the window right here. So th those folks all should be doing everything differently. Everything should be on the blockchain. They realize it. We realize it. It's just that what, what the community has offered to them so far has fallen short. And I think Ava has addressed the needs that they have as well as addressed the needs that everybody has from, from uh, digital tokens. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks very much for chatting with me and I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you so much. Great to be here.